we're really happy to have Ellie here uh, to continue this conversation and give us a different perspective, perhaps. Um, I think we'll just go without further ado. And Ellie, you have a presentation here and we'll go from there and then try to fill you in with the kind of things that we've been talking about. So we're, we're really happy to have you here on, a, on another conversation. Great, thanks, Matt. So thank you very much. I feel I feel a little bit um, uh, underdone because I haven't been in these conversations, so I'm not quite sure what you what what it is that you have been talking about. So um, I hope that this perspective from the Atlas uh, is is going to be um, will fit in magically somehow fit into the discussions that you've already been having. Um, so uh, I work with the Atlas of Atlas of Living Australia. I'm based in Melbourne, um, in Victoria, in uh, southern southern mainland Australia. Uh, we've just welcomed a whole lot of uh, international visitors to Hobart, which is even further south on the island of Tasmania. Um, and I think some of the people who've just been in Australia are joining us on the conference today. So um, hi to all of you. So. The Atlas of Living Australia um, is Australia's data aggregator. It's the Australian node of GBIF, uh, and it can, currently contains about 100, and, and so it does a similar sort of thing as GBIF. So if you're familiar with GBIF, uh, that the Atlas of Living Australia does the same sort of thing. So it aggregates occurrence records. Um, currently, as you can see in the slide, it has a bit over 130 million records. So um, only a small fraction of what GBIF has, uh, but for Australia, that's still quite um, a large, a, la a, very, a very large data set. It is the largest data set that we um, have. But I, I thought that I wouldn't talk to you about the bit of the Atlas which shows where the data aggregation, where, where you can uh, search the ind individually, the individual occurrence records. Um, I thought instead what I'd talk to you today about uh, is the is what we often call refer to as the species pages, but they are actual, actually taxon pages. So the pages, uh, so because we have pages for every level of the of the hierarchy within the taxonomic backbone. But first, um, I thought we'd start with a quiz. Now the Australians, Arthur Chapman, I saw you join. You're absolutely not allowed to play this game because you know the answer immediately from looking at the map. But anybody else is allowed to play the game. So. Uh, so this is the species within the atlas that has the single most largest, greatest number of records. Um, as you can see from the dots on the map, it's found all around Australia. It's, we don't have occurrences. You can see that we don't have occurrences within a, a, little, a little bit of um, the northwest corner of Australia. It's very, very remote there. Um, and it could be that this species is found there, and we but it's just so difficult to get in there uh, that it's difficult to get any, any occurrences. So let's play. What is it? You can put your answers in the chat. And I can't see the chat, so I won't know if anyone's getting it right or not. But I can see there's, there's three people already who have put their answers in the, in the, cat, in the chat. Uh, Dingo is not correct, nor is eucalyptus, nor is rabbit. So you get a clue, not kangaroo, and definitely not cane toads. First hint, it's a bird, not a rat. Okay, no further offers. Second, it's a reasonably large black and white bird, not a kookaburra. Good, not an emu, both good guesses. It's often seen on the ground, except it's not an emu. Uh, and it won't run away, it won't scare when you approach it. All righty. It's known to swoop cyclists and walkers during the breeding season. And finally, it's the mascot for an Australian rules football team who just won the grand final, which will mean absolutely nothing to anyone who is outside of Australia and doesn't know what Australian rules football is, but we have a winner. Chandra, well done. It is the Australian magpie and Gail as well. Um, so here it is, the Australian magpie. Uh, there's over 1.83 million records in the atlas for this species alone. So we've got lots of dots on that map and lots of information on uh, 
the page that is about the Australian magpie. So if we go to that page and have a look at it, you can see that it's very rich in information. And some of that information I'll come back to telling you a little bit, bit about. There's lots of data, lots and lots of information. As with, the, so the Atlas being an aggregator, as with other, um, uh, other uh, parts of the Atlas where we're aggregating occurrence data, we have taken the approach of aggregating um, species descriptive data as well. So we are not actually in the business at the moment of, um, of, of authoring those pages ourselves. We have thought about some of that, um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that later, um, because we're sort of thinking about maybe we should get into that into that game. So the images are aggregated from uh, the images that you see on each of the taxon pages are aggregated in from user contributions. Uh, so, for example, we harvest from iNaturalist once a week, uh, get records coming in from iNaturalist once a week, and so the images come in. Uh, many of the images of live animals are contributed by uh, iNaturalist users. Specimen images from herbarium museums are also contributed, um, and they come in with the the updates um, from the those institutions. I'll come back to talking about Indigenous languages that you can see there um, later in the talk. The compiled distribution maps, we, we get uh, distribution maps for some taxa, not for all. Uh, so, so compiled and um, uh, model distribution maps we get from some, some organisations, but not all. So we get for some taxa rather, but not all. So BirdLife uh, provides um, aggregated distributions for for birds, obviously, we also have fish distributions too. Um, for the the information that's being shown, uh, so that so the dots on maps that that's actually coming in from the occurrences that we have, and you can then uh, interact with those occurrences uh, occurrence records more fully by either going to uh, the spatial portal if you want to do some modelling and 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 more extensive mapping, or you can go to the individual records. Um, the information uh, that we've got on the left-hand side is being pulled in from Wikipedia. Uh, now, we've just changed that just recently. Prior, uh, a, couple of months, a couple of months ago and forever before that, we had pulled information from the Encyclopedia of Life, who themselves were drawing from Wikipedia. So we've just, uh, we have just updated that. And so now we are pulling from Wikipedia directly. And we've been very grateful to our colleagues at iNaturalist who've helped us work out um, what, how to do the matching. So how to, how to get good matches to Wikipedia articles to make sure that we're pulling the right thing. But I will mention again, one of the little tricks for young players in, that, in our pulling data from Wikipedia. We also have information pulled in from things like uh, on the right hand side, the museum's field guide. So the museum's field guide was uh, an app that was uh, a, a, a series of apps that were created uh, several years ago now by museums all around Australia, uh, where they, where the museums wrote, uh, wrote little um, taxon descriptive pages. So that was individually authored. Uh, and so we've pulled that data in as well. Okay, so that's some of the information on the species pages. We know that the species pages or the taxon pages are the most visited parts of the Atlas of Living Australia. Uh, but until this year, we really didn't know what people were coming for. Like what, did, what did the users of those pages actually want? Um, why were they coming? So we, uh, we did an online pop-up survey, one of those surveys that everybody hates, uh, but we did it anyway. For, so it was any users uh, who were trying to axon a access a taxon page had a survey pop up. We ran it live for two months and we got um, uh, a, close to 2000 total responses. So we thought that was pretty good. So I'll just show you some of the uh, information that we gained from that. So the first question we asked was what information do you look for on a taxon page? So what are you actually here to, to try and find out? There's a, there's a not, so you could answer and you could answer, respondents could answer multiple, um, you know, multiple different things. But by far, what people were looking for was a distribution or occurrence map. Uh, and which, so that was interesting. Um, one of the things that we learned from the fact that people want distribute. So what we're using this information for now is 
to guide our further development of the taxon pages. One of the things about the occurrence map or dots on maps that we're very co conscious of is that the dots on maps that we might have represent uh, the occurrences that have been aggregated into the atlas. They don't necessarily represent a distribution. If you've got enough of them, it might come close to a distribution and something, something like the magpie, we've got so many dots that the distribution looks very similar. But, it, but if you've got few, um, a, a species where you haven't got all that many occurrences, it might not look, it might not actually represent the distribution. So getting model distributions is something that we'll focus on in the future. Images of species. Uh, this is going to become important when, when uh, in the next slide. So lots of people are looking for images. Um, descriptions as well. Lots of people are looking for descriptions. And then um, we're get, getting down to fewer than half, but still quite a few people are looking for things like habitat, um, habitat details. Now we know in the Atlas, uh, the, that information is quite poor. We don't have all that much information on those broader eco ecological um, and habitat and behavioural parameters. So that's, again, an area that we will work on in the future. Um, why are you looking for it? Why are you coming to do things? Um, so research for personal interest is a really interesting one. A number of years ago, when I worked at, uh, worked at Museums Victoria, we did a similar sort of survey uh, about our collections online site and asking why people were coming. We thought we had built the site for researchers. But when we did this survey, we found out that most people were coming saying that they were coming for a personal hobby or interest. And so that surprised us and meant that we needed to take a little bit of a different approach to the information that was provided, uh, the links that were provided, that sort of thing. And so uh, the fact that uh, the most, the largest group of people saying they're doing research for personal interest is a bit the same with the Atlas. We think that the Atlas is research infrastructure, but in actual fact, uh, people, are, people say they're coming for personal interest research. And that's also borne out in the registrations that we get in the Atlas. So everybody who comes to parts of the Atlas has to, has to log in and register. And when they do that, they tell us who they are. And the, the single largest group of registrants are people who, are, who say that they're doing personal interest research. The images, as I mentioned before, people say they're coming looking for images. Um, and they say they're trying to, and then a lot of people say they're trying to identify a plant, an animal or something else I've seen. The interesting thing is that is that they're not necessarily asking for keys. They're, they're hoping to identify something just on the basis of a look at the distribution and the images that they see. So that's an interesting challenge for us as well, and how to how to integrate um, better identification methods in. And then we've got a group of people who do say that they're coming for research, for scientific or professional research. And then there's a, a, a long tail after that. So we made a number of recommendations, which the Atlas is now working through. Um, so uh, the Firstly, around um, distributions, we want to make sure that we can provide model distributions as much as we can uh, and are seeking help to, uh, to get those model distributions. We're also very concerned about the, the quality of occurrence records because we know that this has been an area in the past where, uh, where quality affects people's perception of distribution. So, um, I mean, there's, there's simple things that we can do such as when we've got, uh, we've, we've always had a bunch of koalas that uh, show up swimming around Japan. And that's just because someone's forgotten to put the negative in the latitude. They're easy ones to interpret. The much more difficult ones to interpret are ones where uh, the, the dot is clearly in the wrong place, but you can't tell whether it's because the, the taxon was misidentified and the dots, the dot's genuine, but the taxon's wrong, or whether the, uh, the dot is in the wrong place and the taxon is identified correctly. That's where we have to actually go back to the original data provider and ask them to have another look. And getting that circular information is actually quite difficult. Some of the institutions like museums and herbaria have a, have a way of doing that uh, and have a method, 
but a lot of the um, smaller providers and particularly citizen science providers may not have a method of actually getting back to the original um, person who made the record. Um, so the images, uh, we used to have very often have quite poor images showing up um, on the species images. Um, so, you know, the little black dot in the tree that claims to be a, um, a particular bird, for example. Uh, so we need images that are uh, well uh, accurately identified, high resolution, well framed and representative. Uh, species, species descriptions, we need them to be accurate, current and detailed. Uh, and then, and the keys. For researchers, um, what we need to ensure is that the text descriptions where we're providing them are sourced from authoritative providers, because that's important to the researchers. We need to be able to address these data quality issues promptly. Um, and the biggest thing that we're working on at the moment is ensuring the taxonomic backbone is consistent, current, and the source of that backbone is traceable. Uh, and that's a whole other talk, which we can talk about at the moment, but we're putting a lot of work at the moment into upgrading our taxonomic backbone. Here's the very long tail graph. Uh, then we asked what other information would be useful to people. Uh, and people gave us a very long set of answers. Um, but the top one was that they wanted more species specific information. Um, so biology, life stages, ecology, uh, I'd note that the respondents who, was, who were asking for that extra information probably weren't looking at species pages for things like magpies, where there's heaps of information, but looking at uh, groups where they're um, a, a little known and there's um, less information that we can draw in from other, other places. So uh, just a couple of things about where we can improve and what we're doing okay with. So where can we improve? So there's the, the first one is, um, drawing the correct information from Wikipedia. So Wikipedia is a fabulous source, but we do have a problem. We, the Atlas has a problem with homonyms um, coming in. Um, so homonyms where you've got the same, uh, often genus, same genus is used uh, in two very different life forms, uh, used for two di very different life forms. Uh, the, the example that just came up yesterday is uh, for this, uh, genus of bombillid flies, which is called anthrax. Anthrax, as you will probably be familiar with, is also a very nasty bacterial, uh, serious infectious diseases. So until yesterday, uh, we had some pictures of flies and some uh, very scary imagery coming in from Wikipedia of people with very nasty skin infections. Uh, and so, um, the homonyms are difficult and make it difficult for the scripting to know what the page, uh, what should be put, brought into onto the page. Uh, a, an improvement we've made just recently, which has been fantastic, is to add an um, administrator function at the back end, which allows us very quickly to manually update uh, the, the species page that, that, that our taxon page should be, sorry, the page in Wikipedia that our taxon page should be looking to for the information. So we can now that fix that really, really quickly. So that's great. But the homonym problem still remains. The other thing uh, that is, a, is an ongoing problem is the lack of links to literature. Uh, so we have within our taxon pages, we have a, a tab called names. Uh, this draws in all of the, uh, the literature links from, uh, from our main taxonomic backbone name source, which is the Australian Plant Census, Australian Plant Names Index and Australian Faunal Directory. But the links to li the literature is all brought in as strings, not as, as something that is dynamic and able to be uh, able to be actually used as a link, even though even when there's uh, plenty of information out there and particularly in BHL. We did do a little test project uh, to try to work with the ABRS, who are the sources of the names, uh, to get those links put into the data. And, and that's an ongoing project. If you want to hear about that project, uh, Nicole Carney and Rod Page did a, um, did a talk at the TADWID conference last year about how to, how to make those links, uh, how to create those links. Um, unfortunately, it's a year later and we still haven't got it into production, but now uh, that's, that's definitely an area of improvement. So lastly, uh, what are we doing well? Uh, there's a few things that I'll just touch on here. 
So one of the projects that I think we're doing well is that we've uh, done an extensive project, language project, with uh, to start to include Indigenous language names. We're working with language centres uh, around Australia. Um, and what we're actually doing is taking traditional knowledge owners out on country and pretty much just going for a walk. And uh, the elders tell us, identify things as we're walking around. Uh, and we record that information. And then we go through a series of series of permissions and, uh, and, and making sure that what we end up putting up in the Atlas is able to be shared. We're still working on the presentation of how to, how to put the, the language words in. One of the things that was important from a UI perspective was that we really wanted to make the, the, the common name in English be in the same font as the common name in language because, or, or the names in language, because they should have the same status. Um, we're also working on better interaction. So we have another series of taxon pages in another part of the ALA, which provides information from the uh, from our Indigenous collaborators about what the, what these species mean to them. They're written in a different way. They're not written in a kind of sciencey way. It's more uh, a Western science way. The taxon pages, as contributed by the Indigenous communities, are written more like what does this look like? What does it feel like? What does it taste like? Does it have a medicinal use? Um, and how does it interact with the environment and with the community? So, but there are a whole set of different species pages, again, which I haven't, I haven't put in just um, to keep the time a bit shorter. So anyway, the Indigenous Languages Names Project is, is, is a good project. There's a little write-up that I've put up uh, um, that, to find out more, which is in the Google, Google Notes doc. Plant traits. Uh, so we've worked recently with a group from uh, the University of New South Wales and their collaborators uh, to include um, a plant trait database called Austraits into the Atlas. And so the plant, so the Austraits team uh, have measured traits for 30,000 different specimens across uh, 30,000 species and about 500 traits. Uh, so what we've done is for each of those traits, uh, each of those species, we've now included the, the traits data in. We don't yet have much information about whether the traits data is being used or being accessed, but um, but it's it's now there and available for people who do want to use it. Finally, uh, there's something that we've also worked quite hard to improve is uh, listing of threatened species. So right down in the bottom left hand corner, you can see that this little frog, the bore bore frog, uh, is listed as critically endangered in Australia and Victoria. And so we've done a lot of work over the last year of actually understanding what those lists mean because they're kept at different levels of government and sometimes the lists don't agree with each other and sometimes the lists uh, have um, interesting species. They have spelling errors, they have species with, uh, with names no longer in use, uh, sometimes there's only one species that is on um, a biosecurity list that we cannot find any reference to anywhere. So very occasionally you get things that are just seem to be made up. So um, that's a quick run through of uh, what we're doing in the Atlas with taxon pages. I've only touched on a very few things today. Uh, there's many, many more things that we could think about but um, and talk about, but uh, I we can go from here and open up the discussion. So thank you very much for having me. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you while my headset's working for putting that together, Ellie. And that was amazing. And I know that we'll have a very rich conversation now. So please, Matt, take it away with Ellie. Well, I would first, yeah, also say thank you, Ellie, for taking the time. It's, it's extremely timely for the much smaller but but highly related effort are taxon pages with 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 no space uh, project. Um, and I don't know how much time you've had to look at those. Yeah, I just wanted to echo the thanks and um, there's a lot of parallels from what we've been thinking about and I don't know if you've had a chance to look at taxon pages with no space. Um, we've been showing those off for our meeting. Um, 
my my gut home, my gut feeling is do you want to be the the uh, spiritual guide and and leader of taxon pages our effort and i say that somewhat uh somewhat you know teeth and i know we all have extra jobs but um part of what we're going to present tomorrow in our business meeting you will be sleeping i'm assuming um is the need for someone <clears throat> to grow a community around this concept of this taxon page software and what should it serve and it's super evident that you are the person and that kind of research that you've just done the the polls that you've just run are are the insights that we need to you know build out what we're building in the the amount of just convergences and jose i if you if you used uh ala's taxon pages as inspiration let us know but there's just an immense amount of a uh, everything to the aggregated map right that you missed our cached map thing where we're aggregating map to the images on the side to the common names on top to the breadcrumbs on top of that to the general layout and the clean look and feel is is the the parallels are scarily similar right um and so we're thinking about it in terms of like the kind of developer resources and how to atomize these kind of things jose in the background is just literally today we had the idea of making each panel sort of stand alone and then testable in an, in these frameworks like Next.js or Fiddle JS Fiddle, so you could customize and sort of tune them. And then Taxon Pages is a custom framework where you can pick which panels you want to see. So there's some elements of software sharing. Can we sell? Can we share map widgets, uh, common name windows, uh, breadcrumb windows, where the data just come in from the API in the same way, but we could use them, you could use them, um, that kind of thing. There's a big discussion there. Uh, I think there's also a, a clearly then the discussion too of um, what should we build? I, I think it's very clear that you gave us a priority list, right? People want to know where it is. They want to see what it looks like. Okay, well, we did that, sorry, right? But now we have this big discussion of we shared these ideas of unified filters and all of the powerful ways we can query and annotate and add references inside TaxonWorks. Do people also need that functionality in the context of taxon pages, right? So you presented the endpoint, but then people want to get to that endpoint in many different ways. And how how do decisions about um, creating that infrastructure to get to those points? How do you create filters on top of that? That's an open discussion. And the big thing is that we have limited resources to some degree, yeah. of course. And how do we prioritize these things? And how do we how do we do that to meet the basic needs, but also then create an environment where the next cool, aha, super useful thing that we haven't thought of becomes available. So yeah, great, great summary of what's out there from your perspective. I don't know, does anybody wanna chime in and have questions for Ellie or, or I don't wanna dominate the, the back and forth and the conversation here. I see Scott knows how to deal with the homonym issue. Uh -huh. Excellent. Yeah. We'll be in touch. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't want to dominate either. I have a couple of things I'd like to add, but I'd like to hear from others first. So I'm going to wait. So I'm just, I'm just looking at Paul Brock's comment. Um, there, yes, there it definitely is, Paul. Uh, there is a, a, a delay, and that's one of the things that with um, so there's sorry if, if people are not looking at the comments. Uh, there's a there's a there's a, a long delay at the moment between uh, a paper being published, that paper getting into the national species lists, which uh, are the, either the Australian Faunal Direct Directory or the Australian Plant Names Index. Australian plant census, and then that information coming through to the Atlas. At the moment, that's a very, very laggy process. Uh, and in so, so, so laggy that sometimes it, it can take years for a, a newly described species to actually flow through into the Atlas and appear within the taxonomic backbone. Um, so part of that, the Atlas doesn't have very much control over because that's ABRS's processes around how quickly can they update their canonical names list for Australian flora and fauna. But then the bit that the Atlas can do something about, which is how quickly are we updating from the canonical names list into 
into the atlas. That's the bit that we can do something about. Uh, and there's a project that's been going on all year to try and update, initially update the Australian names list and make it sensible because there was all sorts of stuff that had gotten in there over the years built up um, that, that no longer made any sense. Uh, so how do we get a better names list to start with? And then how do we make it updatable really quickly? Um, so we're, we're trying to get to the point where we're updating, pulling from ABRS virtually constantly so that we can, so we don't, so we get rid of that lag. And it's a really big issue. We're also working with Checklist Bank as well. So we're working with the team over at, um, who are at Catalogue of Life to make sure that the Australian checklists are coming uh, are better integrated with GBIF as well. Uh, Ellie, I want to just play off that theme because it's a note that I've I've written on 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 latency, essentially the gaps, the lag between these these time. And I'm curious, we 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 do the same things and we're tackling the same issues and latency comes from many directions. So it seems like there's an opportunity for taxon pages to communicate this. How out of date is this? How recent is this? Um, are these sections all the same recency? Um, I'm showing you a map, but I know it has to be rebuilt every six hours. How do I, we, so we have an example of communicating that. Um, it seems like there's a whole visual uh, or, or, or information framework that we could apply as a theme on top of our taxon pages that indicate this or try to communicate this, just like we're similar ideas that we have English and, and native languages. Um, what's the visual uh, uh, similar bit to that to say this is out of date or this isn't? Have you thought about that at all? Um, we've, we've thought about it, but we haven't got a solution. Yes, yeah, to be yeah. honest, yeah, um, it's it's still it's it's still a really tricky problem. Um, mm -hmm. The other the one of the difficulties that the atlas faces as well is needing to, um, uh, which is a is problem that uh, I'm sure GB faces, but they face in a different way, um, which is around. So the atlas has a has this requirement around the threatened species and around um, biosecurity listed species. So in particular species that are not yet that are not yet in Australia that um, that have a biosecurity alert status. Now they're particularly problematic because they're definitely not in the Australian names list. Um, so we're not getting that data out of the Australian names lists because those species aren't yet in Australia. Mm. Uh, so um, we we have a real difficulty in that we've got a, so the thing that's been built is called the Large Taxon Collider, which takes these different lists. So uh, government threatened species lists, the actual authoritative source lists, uh, the um, biosecurity lists, and kind of has to munge them all together into, a, into, a, um, into this one single backbone so that it can be searched. So that's also one of the problems with the, like, one of the areas where we get latency because smashing that all together uh, and trying to get a single list out of it is, is um, a pretty inefficient way to do it. Uh, and it generates lots of, in, in the past, it's generated lots of er errors. So uh, we only do it, and because it's such a big thing to do, that's another reason why it's slow is because we've only done, like we've only done it infrequently because it's this massive update each time. And so what where we want to get to is where it's not this massive update that takes six months to do um, and, and three days of processing to actually create the list. We want to get it so that we're just incrementally improving so that it could be much faster. Thanks. There's a bunch of interesting topics. Scott, you're waiting to chime in there, I think. Yeah, a couple of um, pointers. Um, that, um, this is one of the issues we've had in Wikipedia as well. Um, is when to actually add a new species to the various lists. And we do actually discuss that um, on every, pretty much any new species where they make a new page. We discuss when to put the page in. And it's not, we try to avoid letting it happen, you know, the day after the paper came out. Um, because what you'll find is, um, a significant number of the species that get described are sunk within 12 months. 
and um, it's not all of them, it's not a lot of them, but it's enough of them to be annoying. And when you've got to then undo all the damage that was done by listing it too soon, it'll um, cause major problems. Um, and you've got to remove everything, reverse everything, change everything back the way it was, just because you've sunk a species three months, three months after it came out. Um, so we wait. Um, and what we wait for is the first review paper that uses it um, elsewhere. And um, so basically, if they're using it and they're saying, yeah, that's a good species, we're going with that, they described it, fine, time to start using it. Um, that's where we do it. Um, it means obviously there's still a lag, but at least we've got a, a definition of what that lag's going to be. And um, I, I really wonder why you're following ABRS in this. Are you required to? Yeah. Yeah, I yep. had a horrible feeling that was the case. I, yeah. I remember <laughs> what ABRS was like. I had an ABRS grant once. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. Um, yeah, because um, we won't do that. We won't follow a particular, especially agencies. We will not follow agencies because agencies are always um, problematic in their timing. Um, what we prefer to look for is first review. And that can often be within a few months, within reason, not always. In it. The other thing that comes into um, issue is uh, how wonderful the species is. Is it some beautiful, cute and cuddly vertebrate or is it some worm that no one cares about? Unfortunately, it also matters um, in the speed. Yes, I do. Oh, that's. I think that's a very well known phenomenon that the cute cuddlies get get uh, more attention than the squishy worms. Yeah, Scott Laurie uh, from My Naturalist pointed this out uh, yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yet, and and then, and sorry, and that was Rudolph uh, Meyer, yeah. that, you know, pointing out that all of the diversity is. That is out there is still the the dark taxa that aren't cute and cuddly. Yeah. Yeah. So I always wonder about that charismatic species conversation. Is uh, is it also opportunity? I mean, I did see a post yesterday on like Twitter about or X, whatever I'm supposed to call it, some horrible image of somebody's gut, human gut, and there was something moving in there that really shouldn't be there. Ugh. <laughs> anyway, it was some sort of parasitic worm that came from eating sushi. But anyway, <clears throat> it's not very charismatic, but it certainly gets your attention and it helps you see a world that you would otherwise never get a chance to see. And I think about with that with things like diatoms, you know, scale, uh, uh, tardigrades, the opportunities that we have in order to make things that otherwise no one would ever see visible, which I think are really um, key to engaging people. So, yeah, I'm not sure about the... Whether maybe that's an opportunity that some people, you know, the ugly doll phenomenon, people like some of that stuff. They find it really cool. So how, how do we capitalize on that? I don't know. Yeah. One of the one of the things that one of the other bits of analytics that I didn't talk about that the Atlas has is um who who's going to who where the Atlas pages, uh taxon pages appear in search results. Mm -hmm. Um and another thing that we know is that um, for for common for for lots of birds, for example, where there's lots of information already out on the internet, and um, BirdLife might be putting out pages, and the Australian Museum might be putting out pages uh, describing particular bird species. Is the um, is the atlas tends to get bumped down, but where the atlas uh, does come up um, higher in search results is for those um, the less known species because the atlas covers. The, the much the the broader the breadth of it, um, and so it they they those species will come up higher, so mm. they will get some measure of amplification, and thus the data that's being drawn from somewhere like Wikipedia will get some. Not that Wikipedia needs necessarily amplifying, um, because people know how to get to Wikipedia anyway. Um, <laughs> so, um, but uh, that. That that's where people people do come to the atlas to do end up on the atlas because the species pages are coming higher in the results 
for uh, for the non charismatic species. Hmm. So on that note, I have a general question that several people here know I've, I've asked similar. Because we talk about the need for expertise and help from different directions, from the public, from experts, and because we talk about gaps, collecting gaps, taxonomic gaps, and then we talk about building these lists, does your, do your pages or your projects, are they thinking about ways to highlight where the gaps are? Here's the places on the planet that are under collected. Here's the, oh, here's this lovely list of names. Oh, by the way, there's a giant gap here. We know that there's, you know. So how can we help the public and each other advertise those gaps as essentially an opportunity? So it's not just the knowledge inside your own group. It's kind of like saying who were the species pages for in the first place? If they were for the experts looking for the published paper and the citation, or are they also so that somebody like me can join the UCD group and help them pull biological associations out of papers they haven't processed yet? And so that's a gap that they have. But how do they find people like me? So how does the Atlas look at advertising gaps or do they? So that's one thing that our, so we now have a we have an outreach and communications um, um, function or um, and well, the communications function is, is separate, but we've got an outreach and training um, person who's looking at just that. And we've got one of the teams, uh, which is the science team, is is looking at data visualizations around gaps um, in order to to do that. We we have a, a function within the Atlas which is called Explore Your Area, where you can uh, where we've mapped, and and this is not necessarily an easy thing to do, but we've mapped postcodes to uh, um, to to shape files so that you can type in your postcode and say, give me all the things that are found in my in my area. And that'll get that'll generate you a species list of everything that's um, has been where we've got an occurrence for it. But what we're then going to try and extend that into is 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 that gap, that gap information. So yes, great, I can see what's in my area, but what would I expect to see in my area that nobody's seen before, seen yet, um, would be interesting. And because because we know that people like that hyper local focus, um, and particularly in co you know particularly during those COVID years, we saw the rise of, of really hyper local projects. Like in Australia, we had the birds that we have the birds in backyards um, census that runs every year, where we ask people simply to go into their backyard. And, um, and and record the birds that come through the back through your backyard. Uh, you can certainly see people doing that for um, common garden invertebrates as well, for example. So that gap that gap piece we're trying to address at the moment on a hyper local um, kind of from a hyper local angle, but we can also very easily do visualizations of um, of where the Get where the collecting gaps are when we have people who come and say we want to be able to do a particular um, uh, we want to be able to do a particular survey or whatever uh, you know what's it, it's there's a program called Bush Blitz which goes out into particular defined geographic areas to survey everything and they definitely take lists of species out with them. Um, uh, no, th this is the expected species list and this is the this is this this is the species list of things that don't get seen here but could potentially live here. Yeah. So that yeah, the gaps issue, gaps filling is really it's a really interesting one. So on a very pragmatic note, uh, your answer is lovely and very nuanced. I mean, when we rebuilt the species pages that we were uh, Matt gave you a brief introduction to, one of the things I I asked us to please do is all include on the pages a, a gaps as opportunity section literally put it out there so if you're the plecoptera group and you know about plecoptera what do you know about your gaps and can you put something there that says um this one's very here all projects of this nature etc contact us if you'd like to help these but if you could you could see that you could put something here that's very targeted you know, this is what this area is missing or this group is what, so helping students, helping the public, helping other people connect to, oh, I can help you fill your gaps or I can write a grant for that. 
right? But but keep getting it out of just that isolated community and into a broader a broader space. I do want to note, uh, I've seen a couple of people drop off. I want to thank those people who have to drop off uh, for attending for so long. It's been a long day. Um, Ellie, I'm not sure of your time. I do have a couple more questions maybe, or then we might have time if, if you can stick around. But um, yep. for those of, for those folks who have to drop off, uh, again, I think we'll have this video. We'll have to check with you, Ellie, et cetera. Um, but we're hoping to share it. And I do thank you if you have to take off and maybe we'll see you tomorrow. Um, so Ellie, I had a question about um, about your taxon pages and being adding function on top of them. Um, so I saw just in looking at your quick couple of links that there were some actionable things you could do, like add an occurrence, right? And to linking those. So has there been any like theory or philosophy about um, what to make actionable? Like in our in our philosophy for you missed the prior discussion that we had with Jen. Um, about how our taxon pages came to be. It, in part, it came out of needing or, or thinking that it's desirable to split curatorial software from presentation layer. I, thinking of it as curation tools and then a rendering, many different ways to render, many different ways to exposing. And so if we put all those two together, then we have this challenge that we have to maintain things like security for our users and um, balance those with people that are in the public that don't need that security, right? So the idea was that if we split those worlds, we would have a more uh, robust system. One of them could die and the other one could sort of live on as a code base. But I see that you have functionality in taxon pages, in your taxon pages. And I would just wonder if that's a thought of like, when do we put a new button to make something actionable, to engage our community, to take them out so that we can touch the data, right? Annotate it, maybe add data, et cetera. How is those decisions made in the design of the web pages? Uh, interesting question. So we're doing a user interface and user experience review as we speak. Um, so that's that's something that we're, um, and if I, if, if at my, if our project manager on that project, Javier was here, he'd be able to tell you all about what, what they're thinking about how to, mm -hmm. In, engage users in in action more. Um, uh, that process is only just starting, so there's nothing even um, that I can show you yet. That's one of those projects where ninety percent of the project is going to be in the preparation of the the preparation of the ideas, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. and then um, the the last ten percent will be the actual doing of the ideas. Mm -hmm. um, what I didn't show you was the parts of the ALA. Uh, where you can you can interact much more with the occurrence records. So you go you get sent from the taxon pages to a whole different bit of the ALA to interact with the occurrence records. Um, but in those other parts, you can do things like filter the records. Um, uh, you can view them through the lens of through through a chart, through a map. Uh, you can review you can view them just as as the data. You can annotate the records if there's a data quality issue that you want to raise. Um, annotating records is is that's another area of interest to improve at the moment because the annotations currently are just one. You can only do it on a record a record at a time, mm -hmm. and so the, having the ability to say all these thirty records are wrong, um, are in the wrong spot. They're floating in the there's fungus floating in the ocean. Mm -hmm. uh, it, so there's been a, a, a query to have a facility to do bulk annotations. There's also a query, there's also a request in, which is from the data providers to say, can we have a bulk response mechanism? Um, so the data providers want to be able to say, yes, we've looked at your annota the annotation suggestion and we want to say that we've either updated the data or we don't agree with you, so bad luck. Um, uh, we use, so, for example, the classic one that we used to say was um, there was uh, one of the providers provided a subfossil record for thylacines, so Tasmanian tigers, um, and people constantly used to annotate that record to say, but that's a thylacine, that's not found, you know, that's not found. And, and so the person, the data, the um, collection manager had to constantly go in and say, yes, we've verified that record, we've got another record. Uh, which is a well-known example as well of a record which is uh, taken on a marine cruise where they 
deliberately um, did the trawl along the equator. So the um, so you get zero zero you get a zero latitude, and that one's constantly being flagged as well um, to for people going that latitude must be wrong, and they're like, no, you can actually sail along the equator. There's a thing that you can do. Um, so allowing providers to make comments back to the annotations is another thing within the spatial portal, which is another way of interacting with the occurrences. Uh, that's where you can actually do. Uh, you can add layers, so you can add habitat layers or vegetation layers, or um, you can even add roads. Uh, you can in, add indigenous protected areas and map your occurrences against those different layers to start looking for um, start looking for whatever it is that you're looking for. So there are other places when the atlas you can do a lot more um, interaction with the records, um, but the taxon pages are relatively static. Like I said, though, what we're try what we're experimenting with is is whether we should make whether we should open it up to um, allow people to start generating information around taxa. But we don't want to replicate Wikipedia. Um, but uh, for example, we've had requests come in from people who want to upload character lists. Um, so they've been collecting character matrices for years about a particular taxa, and they want to be able to upload that. Um, so we've got the Austraits data, which is is sort of that was a project, but these might be individual researchers who want to do things like that. And we don't have a facility for that at the moment, so we're thinking about how to provide that. But maybe Taxon Works will give us the answer. Well, so so my thought was the first the easy target is that much of what you've talked about I know we do cover, right? And could we could we give you do you have a standard that we can provide you? Like there is no standard at like GBIF is not taking character data and specimen data and you know even with its extensions, um, there's going to be richness that it that is going to be difficult to provide. Maybe not. Maybe we could hack something together. But for examples, I would love to consider um, packaging sort of basically complete revisions that are highly highly atomized and then you know feeding it to ALA or feeding it to portals that can provide that functionality so that we can keep taxon pages relatively static, but give other people opportunities to look at interactive ways of doing it. So yeah. we would definitely love to have that conversation and to also be a, to a, a sort of the, that expert endpoint where people can aggregate that data. And you talked about not having enough citations, I think in the past, or maybe that was a previous talk. And you know that we excel at attaching citations to data at all levels, right? Uh, that kind of thing. So yeah, it would be cool to see how to play off all all of what you're talking about. I wish we could just add a, one of our devs and you know have Jose just lurk, or maybe yeah. Debbie can lurk and and come back and say, guys, ALA is doing this. We should do it this way. <laughs> <laughs> we this just kind of so did relevant. that in the other direction, right? Where I sat with Niels yeah. causing good. For a day in the um, in the museum in the herbarium, right in in Victoria, there, to so he could see what we're doing, Matt, from our end. Is yeah, he yeah. certainly looking at copying some of that uh, or riffing on it? So, yes, it would be great somehow to continue this alignment. It's really nice Excellent. to have meta concentrated studies to figure it out, right? Like we can brainstorm about it. We can use our past experience from what we've seen on the web and the stories that we've heard mm -hmm. about problems or successes, but it's really, I'm going to reiterate, it's really wonderful to see these quantitative graphs and give us targets and mm -hmm. help shape our conversations. An another parallel conversation that we could look to for some of that data, because I know they're really good at, at gathering the same sorts, is indeed Steen DuPont and the others at the Natural History Museum in London who are building Recode. Uh, which is going to be their new collection management, um, potentially public face, well, I'm not sure, software, because they're asking the same kinds of questions. And Ellie, I think you were aware of that. For those of you who are not, in other words, um, there's a genealogy model. I could give you guys more examples later. But this notion of how do you empower the people who are looking at your data to do annotations that are actionable um, and, and so that decisions can be made. And at the same time, it, it plays on what Rudolph said and what people have heard me say before, uh, the public has expectations, right? And so when you go to do something like that, you bring that humanness to the task 
how can we actually take advantage of it? And the genealogy community has been doing this now for about a good 10 years. So hopefully we can learn from Recodes trying to also implement something very similar to what you were describing, Ellie. Matt, would you like to wrap up in our last three minutes? Or, or Ellie, would you like any final thoughts? Are there, is there any action? Sorry, I go wish ahead, I could um... have joined, for, joined longer. So I, oh. I'll look forward to, to catching up um, on some of the previous discussions that have been that were had while I was sweetly sleeping. Yeah, we had a really wonderful day overall, I think. Um, some nice connections and some, some good ideas yesterday, too. It was good. Um, is there one actionable item we can take from from this uh, meeting, from your talk? Is there one thing we can do in the future that is sort of easy that uh, keeps this going? Or what, what? Can I be flippant? Sure. My one, the one actionable item would be keep talking. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that, no, that's Plus one. That's exactly it. <laughs> requires requires us to memor and to make those. You know, five, set, setting times and stuff. So, so Debbie and I will try to set times, I guess, in the moving forward. For Matt and I have been discussing for some time the podcast. I, I, I hesitated a bit. I don't necessarily want to formalize something into a podcast. I would like to have these kinds of sort of open discussions with a group of people where we can talk at this level. Um, and there are some people I've reached out already to approach about such a thing. And I think it it helps bring a longer perspective to the topic here. You, again, Ellie, you didn't get to hear some of these others, but just like we had with Arthur at Tadwig, having somebody who's been in the community a long time, having somebody who's new to the community, having people who are uh, tangent to us from different worlds, super helpful for finding alignment, finding out where we actually can help each other and benefit, uh, and we have to talk to do that. So. Yeah. Arthur is actually here. Yes, he um, is, which is yeah. yeah another reason why. I... <laughs> yes. So I want to say thank you again, uh, Ellie, for putting that together yeah. for us. Really appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, it was really great. Uh, exactly what we needed to see. It's it's super timely in terms of rolling out taxon pages sort of officially for our perspective. And and um, tomorrow we're actually going to talk about again what can we do to. Um, make taxon pages, grow a community around it. Maybe it needs to be a Tadwig standard, right? Uh, Arthur's uh -huh. here. Maybe we need to have a UI, a UI UX standard for, I think I proposed something like this a couple of years back that standards grow out of tools and tools grow out of standards and vice mm -hmm. versa. And so maybe there's a room for shared standard breadcrumbs and common names and maps and stuff that could be done in code and then given official stamp of approval i don't know i don't so, know where it takes but yeah on that note too i put it in the chat and some of you may have seen it though and ellie is current chair of the biodiversity information standards tadwick so oh. she's we have uh, the current and the past on either side of me current Wonderful. and the past yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. so all we're right happy to have you and thank you and thank you everybody yeah. thanks everyone for hanging around it's been a long day yeah. um good to see you all